Hi, my name is Bob Leatherbarrel. I'm a kiln floor and glass artist living on Salt Spring Island on the west coast of Canada. I was born in Montreal and grew up in the Ottawa Valley. And after high school, I went to university and got a degree in geology. And that was my working career for uh, almost 30 years. I worked in the oil exploration business. But my geology really ties into my, uh, my art, and as you'll see throughout the, this discussion. After leaving university, I was working for an oil company. And in, in my uh, spare time as a hobby, I took up stained glass. I don't have a formal training in art, but I have pursued it as a passion. And it's one of these hobbies that got way out of hand. So it started off as a hobby and eventually I got into kiln form glass. I really enjoyed it. it as you'll see, it ties into my background in science. And um, that led to it becoming more of a passion and became a job. And when I retired a few years ago, it uh, became a full-time job and I'm pretty well living uh, on working on glass now. It's uh, my full-time activity. Uh, what kiln form glass is probably not familiar to most people. It, it's actually the ancient form of making glass. It's been revitalized in about 1980 to its current uh, popularity, but it's not done like a blown glass where it's a hot glory hole and, and, and molten glass. This is all done in electric kilns and each piece to make it takes several firings and each firing takes around about a day. And so initially you start off with your glass, you have to melt it together and you make it into a flat disc. And then in um, subsequent stages, you shape that disc or add more design elements to it. You shape it into a bowl or whatever, whatever object you're thinking about. So um, it's a much slower process. It involves very specialized materials. The glass has to be made specifically for fusing. And uh, if it doesn't work, uh, if it isn't compatible, the glass will break. It's um, a very, very science-based, so it really relies on understanding the properties of glass, how glass behaves in the kiln, and what happens as it uh, heats and cools, and making lots of visual observations. I'm going to take you on a bit of a voyage now for how I've done uh, my kiln form class over the years. Let's go to the beginnings of the 80s, when you decided to get into glass. What made you decide that glass is your medium? Uh, I chose glass because, um, first of all, I just enjoy the creative process. And if it wasn't glass, it probably would have been wood. I really uh, love being around creative people. And uh, I think it's a real treat. I found... Um, the transparency and the color of glass uh, just really caught my eye. And because I could actually do it in my studio um, fairly easily with cheap tools, it really got me started on it. And um, I just got totally engrossed in it. And so the stained glass eventually led into working with kiln form glass. Kiln form glass is, um, it's all done with computerized kilns that are specially made for working with glass, but the ancient uh, glass made in Mesopotamia in Egypt 5,000 years ago was the same idea, except for they just used dung fired kilns. And um, glass, the history of glass is, is that it's a functional object. It was used for serving dishes, it was used for transporting wine and olives all through the Mediterranean. And what I've tried to do in my glasswork is actually honor that tradition and keep the functional aspects of glass there, but to elevate, try to bring out the beauty of it and uh, really make it. It sounds to me that it takes quite a few years to master these techniques. Kill form glass is, uh, as I said, it starts it started in the uh, modern version of it started in the 1980s. And um, at that time, there wasn't very much information available. There was very few books and um, there was no internet. And so <laughs> you just had to learn by uh, making mistakes. And part of my scientific training is learning uh, the scientific method and 
taking mistakes, trying to figure out what the physical, chemical, and observations are that led to that and, and correct them. And I, I kind of joke that I have a whole corner of the Calgary dump with my name on it because I just made one mistake after another when I was starting, but I'm a persistent person and I kept working at it. And eventually I started understanding the properties of glass and um, how it worked and it's getting more and more success, getting larger and larger pieces, more complex. And it it's taken 30 years, but now I have pretty, uh, pretty good success. There's not very many pieces that, that break on me. I'm a firm believer in, in uh, failing and a glass is very difficult to work with. And, you know, it's one of the piece of art at room temperature, but here you're firing the glass at uh, about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit or 820 degrees Celsius. And the glass is molten, it's red hot, it doesn't look at all like uh, it does at room temperature. And failures are really high, but um, I think that if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. And so by you learn by your mistakes, failure, another word for failure is experience. And so yes, there's a lot of failure, failure that goes into it, but uh, if you are learning every piece, you reduce that, that chance of failure. Let's talk about special glass and special kilns. The, uh, the glass that's made for, for kiln form glass, first of all, it, it, you can't just use window glass or regular stained glass because those glasses will, will break uh, in the kiln. They'll, they'll lose a lot of the properties that they're known for in the heating process. And so uh, there's a, several companies I work with, a, glass made by a company called Bullseye. And what they do is they make the sheet glass and when it's, when it's uh, melted together, the glass will all, uh, they call it fit. There'll be no stress in the glass when it co cools back to room temperature if it's done properly. And so uh, it won't break. And what Bullseye does is they make sheet glass and then they take that sheet glass and they make all different components. So they make powders, which you'll see a lot of in this presentation, uh, thing called frit, which is like sand grains. They make stringers, they make noodles. They make all sorts of different products around that color. And they have a, quite an extensive color palette, but the colors all have to be fit together. They have to be compatible. And then the, the tool that I use is a, a kiln. And it's an electric kiln, it's got a computer uh, on it. And it will uh, has very even heat distribution throughout the body of the kiln. And uh, you can program it to heat up at a certain rate, so many degrees Celsius per hour, and go to a certain temperature, hold it there. And you need to be able to have that sort of control so that when the piece fires, um, it, it does exactly as you want it to. So these are specially made kilns. They're not as hot as, as ceramic kilns, but uh, they're, they're very, very accurate and precise. How did you choose your kiln? Did you do a lot of research? Did you test them? There's several different brands on the market. They're all pretty good. Uh, I've had a teaching studio for quite a few years, so I have quite a few kilns. I have seven kilns total. And um, I just use word of mouth. I, I do all my own kiln maintenance. I don't have very much to do. I'm, I'm very careful with them. And some of my kilns are 30 years old, so they, they do last a long, long time. Um, they're pretty straight. They're just like a, a big wall oven with more insulation. We start off generally with, with uh, making the, they call it the blank, which, which is the, several layers of glass that are fused together. And um, they most of the design components and most of the color or the ge uh, geometric shapes or whatever you're doing. And that's the hottest firing. It'll go up to 50 to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit or about 790 to 810 degrees uh, Celsius. And um, that will melt everything together. But then if you want to add more relief to it with with uh, elements that are sitting on top that are lightly fused on. Then you heat it up a second time. You have to cool it down properly, 
build your new design, heat it up a second time. And this time you'd only go to maybe 720 degrees Celsius or 1325 Fahrenheit. And then the third phase is to shape it, which is even a lower temperature. You take it to somewhere around 610 uh, Celsius or, or uh, 1150 Fahrenheit, and it will slump into a mold or bend over whatever element you have in the kiln to, to, for, that you use for shaping. So it's a three-step process, and each one of those steps takes a full day to fire. So you worked about a decade, the 80s. Uh, you worked on perfecting your techniques, and then in the early 90s and throughout the 90s, you started marketing, your artwork and teaching in local studios? What I did initially with Kiliform Glass was work with uh, taking my stained glass skills, which was a lot of very geometric designs and transforming them into Kiliform pieces. And um, that was quite interesting. And then glass powders came along and I went on a family holiday to the P Pacific Northwest and I saw the artwork of uh, William Morris, an American glass artist, and he works an awful lot with textures and components. And I thought, oh, that, that just stopped me dead in my tracks. And uh, then I went on down to Portland where Bullseye had their, their store and factory and I bought powders. And I didn't realize how much the powders related to what William Morris was doing. So I came back and I sort of abandoned my tight geometric work with a lot of cut pieces and I started working with powders. And that's what really got me going into education and marketing and, and all the success that I've had with, with Kiliform Glass. You are best known for use of glass powders to create textures and blended palette. Can you give us a few examples? So I started working with glass powders and I really enjoyed working with it. And I got in, into working with textures and they started off as a bit of an accident, but uh, I kept persisting with it and working with them. And I started developing this, what's uh, commonly called the crackle texture. And one of the beauties of working with powder is that you can blend them together and <clears throat> you get these painterly effects. So this piece that's on the screen right now, uh, it looks like the, the lower plate is, is orange, but it's actually a combination of whites, oranges, yellows, marigold. There's even little bits of very dark red. And so you blend them together much like you would be doing with, um, with paint. And I really like that. So I started working with this. I developed it and I found that it actually related back to my geological training as well, because in geology, a lot of the things that you do is looking at textures and trying to interpret the environment and deposition or the history of the rock just from looking at the texture. And I found that I was starting to do the same thing with my glass. And, and uh, I really enjoyed textures because from a geological viewpoint, they tell a story. And actually, when you think of it from a human viewpoint, they also tell stories, you know, you can look at uh, uh, the hands of an, an elderly person and see all the cracks in them and you know there's a lot of stories there. So they tell stories and they help to create our reality. And so I've always enjoyed um, having textures in my work. And the other point that I try to do is I try to have uh, something you see when, you, when you're up very close to the piece and something you can see from a distance. So it's I'm trying to get different perspectives on it. So what you see up close might not be the same as what you'd see from a distance. And it's kind of, again, like uh, personal relationships. What you hear from one person may not be the same as what you hear from somebody else when there's a discussion going on. So I try to get those elements of intrigue into my work by using textures and by using blended colors. The other nice thing about it's challenging, but what I really enjoy is that when you work with blended colors, they, they're always, every piece comes out unique and, and, and very different. 
how these particular pieces um, reflect your attachment to powders? So after I worked out this basic crackle texture, I, I got intrigued with how I could experiment with it and change it around. And I started doing different uh, ways of working with powder and came up with different textures. And this, this uh, piece here, it's called bouquet. It's a, a variation of textures based on that original crackle texture. And um, I really enjoy doing it. My wife's an avid gardener, so I was able to make these stylized flowers. And uh, another version of that crackle texture, if you change a few of the, the parameters and how you build it, is what I call pebbles. And I really like the organic look of this. And as I started working with them, I could get uh, this fine line of color around each one of the pebbles. And so it really highlighted the pebbles, made them very interesting. And, and I, I love the idea that they float in the glass. Um, and again, it, it refers back to my geological background with sedimentology. So one of the things that I do with bowls to uh, make them less functional looking is to nest them together. And so uh, this combination here, the, the green and the yellow nested bowls, uh, they're designed to go together, but it moves the piece from being functional to more sculptural. Also, I really like the blending of the colors here in the green bowl. Uh, it's not a color of green. There's all different, uh, there's light colors. There's some white in there. There's some yellows in there. And I'll actually use color combinations that carry from the one bowl, the inner bowl to the other bowl. Uh, it's uh, this whole blending of powder that, that gives it the painterly effect. The little red elements in the middle are uh, made with stencils and I sift powder onto a kiln shelf on top of stencils, lift the stencil off and then fire the, the powder together. So it's just barely um, sintered together and that becomes design elements. I like working with these a lot because it it's, uh, gives you a sense of spontaneity. What I do is I make a whole bunch of different components. And then when I go to make a piece, I can draw on the components to, to uh, do something spontaneous. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's just a really enjoyable way to work. And uh, it gets me away from doing rigid things and, and towards doing more spontaneous work. One of the other things that I, that I mentioned earlier, I, I love the functional aspect of glass that uh, the history of glass is for serving and everything. But um, what I try to do is honor that tradition, but I try to tweak it so it's not obvious that it's functional anymore. And so I, I was doing things like nesting bowls together and uh, having design elements in the very middle that made the piece not usable for a, a fabric, but it still added beauty to it. There are other ways of working with, with kiln form glass, and you can actually collaborate with, with other artists. So this piece here is called uh, When Rhyme and Reason Meet Rock and Roll. And what I did was I made a sheet of glass was textured like these pieces that you've just seen uh, a few moments ago. I cut those into strips, turned the strips up on their side, fused them back together so that I got this layered look. And I had a large sheet that was uh, this this layered uh, texture. I took it to a, a, a hot shop or a, a glass blower, took that and he wrapped it up into a cylinder and closed it off and was able to blow it out into the shape. And so uh, I, I also enjoy doing this crossover techniques with, with other artists and, and using other mediums. I'm a firm believer in happy accidents and um, Phoenix is a piece that, um, was a challenge from beginning to end. And it started off, it just wasn't working. And everything I did, uh, it just wasn't working. And so uh, in the very last step, I ground the rim of that flat 
as you can see, and that changed the whole nature of the piece. And so I call it Phoenix because it kept rising out of the ashes. And it was a, a good example of just being persistent and keep on working on something until uh, it either works or I throw it out. I like the idea of the functional aspects of bulls, but um, here, this was one of these happy accidents. Um, it wasn't supposed to come out like this, but I really like the look of it when it's finished. And it just gives the, the bowl a, a very dynamic look. It looks like it's lifting off the table. When you're working with glass powders, a lot of the times when you're blending colors, you can't, you don't know what you're going to get. And a lot of this uh, depends on chemical reactions. And so this piece here, this uh, small shield has uh, several colors of white in it. And when you assemble the piece, it, it looks white, but there's a chemical reaction that goes on between uh, the dense white and another color called French vanilla and the sulfur and the, the lead react together to form these black lines that outline the, the texture and really, I think, accent the, the piece and really make it quite uh, elegant looking. You would talking about making these sheets and then you are putting the powder and you were talking about these chemical reactions. You're really the, the scientist who talks about that. How do you decide your artistic touch? How, because I'm, I'm thinking it's very hard uh, when you're a scientist and you have to make sure that the you know, the glass doesn't break or it comes out the way it should. At the same time, you have to be an artist and put your soul, put your emotions, put your vision. How do you do that? Uh, quite often, I make pieces that have, I have a vision when I'm starting. What, what do I want to make? Uh, and what am I trying to say? So I'll, I'll be thinking about this quite often. I do sketching. I do a lot of test samples to see if I'm going to get the colors combinations that I want, or if they're going to actually be stable. And, uh, but then once I have a piece in mind, uh, I, I focus on why I'm making it. And I think it's really important as an artist to, to think about what's your piece about. I always visualize being at the opening of a show and somebody comes up to me and says, what's this all about? And I don't talk to them about science. I don't talk to them about chemistry. I talk to them about why I make it. And um, I spend every day in the studio and I'm always thinking about why I'm making these. You know, I'll, I'll be showing some pictures shortly of pieces where I really have put a lot of thought into what I was trying to do with sculptures. Let's talk about this piece you have here, The Usual Suspect. Yeah, uh, the usual suspects is a, a group of. Um, I can. I'll actually put one of them up here. So, the usual suspects. Uh, these are uh, again. It's a kind of functional. I want to make these into large goblets, and. Uh, what they are is they're, they're uh, called dropouts. And so you essentially make a sheet of glass. This glass started off an inch thick, and then you set it up on a, a, a ceramic mold that has a hole in the middle of it. And you have that elevated in the kiln and you heat it and the glass drops through the hole. And when I made these, um, I, I was making all these different textural styles with crackles and what I call color filled veins, controlled orientation, pebbles. And um, I was teaching uh, a lot of the people that I was teaching were saying, oh, I'm going to turn these into dropouts. And I thought, I better get my toe in that water before this happens because it will become quite popular. And so I started making these and I called them the usual suspects because these are my sort of my signature styles that I, that I put together into uh, a collection of, of different goblets. Throughout the history, bowls and vessels actually define humanity. A lot of people say that glass is very functional and it's not a fine art. Uh, and I kind of look at it as saying, well, that's our history. 
and we can't ignore it. And, and I think we should honor it. And I think that's the real challenge. So I do make a lot of vessels and, and bowls and, and um, I've actually <laughs> gotten into arguments with gallery owners about honoring glass. And so I, I think that that's our role as an artist is to honor it. So this piece here is called Brunch and it was part of a, a addition here on the island to the theme of homage. And uh, I, I did brunch as a homage to Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party. And my idea was, uh, was to invite four people who had influenced my art and have them sit and have brunch and, and talk together. And so I made a place setting for each one. And uh, there's uh, Pete Mondrian, Andy Goldsworthy, Lauren Harris, and William Morris. And each one has a, a place setting made in their style and in their, in their philosophy with Andy Goldsworthy's piece, I used all recycled materials. And then, and then I visualized what their conversation would, would be like. So this is a combination of the functional aspects of art, but turning it in, into an installation piece. What about the white tribal bowl with green, blue, ripped edge? The white tribal bowl is a piece that it's a, a functional shape, but I wanted to turn it up on its edge and make it uh, less obviously as a functional object. And uh, so I quite often make fairly deep shapes, but I have them inclined so that they're off center. Um, and I, I just, I think it makes them more sculptural than, than just a, a regular vessel. Then you have sculptures as individual concept pieces and series pieces. I like to do uh, individual pieces as sculptures. And one of them is this piece called Charity. Uh, it was done as a fundraiser here on the island. And what uh, I wanted to do is emulate what the forest floor looks like on the in the Pacific Northwest with ferns and leaf debris and and um, vines and everything. So I'll I'll make something that's very very specific to um, a particular installation or 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 a theme. Some of your work looks a bit like mixed media. This quilted piece was done with uh, my wife Lisa, who's a very accomplished quilter. And we did a, a joint piece, and the idea was to um, show both the qualities of glass and fabric together and have them in a, a, a balanced uh, presentation. And so Lisbeth did the quilting, and this piece is about a meter by a meter, and then I made all these uh, fish. And the fish, I love how fish swim through the, the water in those, those waves. And so uh, the, the panels of the, uh, that the fish are on are all elevated off the front of the, the, um, the quilt pattern. And um, it just has a lovely dynamic look to it. And uh, we all hang by a thread. I'll, I'll tell you wh why I made this piece, the, the theme behind it. We all hang by a thread as a sculpture that hangs. It's about a meter long and it's shaped like an airfoil. And uh, I did this in response to the 2016 American election. And I was really distressed by how uh, news and truth was being distorted. And so what I did was I made this piece and the, the small little colors, colored patches are uh, various colors of uh, white and off-white, and they represent shredded truth. They were, you know, the little white lies. And um, what I did was I, I put them into the sculpture and it's shaped like an airfoil. And so uh, when I was nearing completion, I was wondering how to present it. And I realized that the best way to present it would be to hang it by a steel cable. You can just barely see it at the top. And it's shaped like a, an airfoil wing. So it's perfectly polished on all sides. Uh, and the idea is that it swings in the wind. So it rotates with whatever the current political 
climate is. And I wanted it to be transparent because I think truth should be uh, obvious. There should be nothing hidden and it should be totally transparent. So this was a very cathartic piece for me that allowed me to sort of get the frustration out of my system for the 2016 election. It took me a month to make the polishing alone was was about a week's work with, with various grits. So I had a, a lot of emotional energy was uh, expended in the making of this piece. Your next section is extensive cold working. Uh, I'll show two pieces. The first one I'm going to show is uh, it's called the loud bell of Neath. One of the other characteristics of my work is I do a lot of what's called cold working. And so after the pieces come out of the kiln for the final time, you can alter the surface with uh, diamond tools or sandblasting or various hand tools to uh, change the finish and to change the, the texture of the surface. So I do a lot of work with this. Uh, I think it really brings up the quality of the piece. You know, you can polish edges, you can uh, change the texture, and it really works particularly well with powder. This piece here, the Loud Bell of Neath, it's a, a, a fairly deep bowl. And when you look at the rim, what I've done is I've, I've carved away the white and the, the blue veins that are at the under part of the bowl. I've carved that all away with diamond tools and shaped it and then uh, use uh, diamond tools on what's called a lathe to, to shape the top to get that castellated edge and sandblasted the whole thing. So when you look at it, it has the transparency of glass, but it has a very soft uh, texture to it. So I do a lot of hole working and I also make these, these glass books. And uh, when I, you'll see several images of them, but the glass books are, life size so each book has uh, uh, an inch to an inch and a half thick pages and those pages are all um, sheets of glass with a thin layer of transparent powder in between each sheet before i fired it together the beauty of this is the light can move through the, the glass and it really the pages really glow and um, so i call this whole series light reading and what i'm trying to do is capture the the casual aspect of books in a room. We, uh, Lisbeth's been involved with the publishing industry for much of her life and, and we always have books around. It's a very important part of our life. And so I do these as sort of a reflection of our casual lifestyle. And they're always done in these, you know, walking into a room and just seeing a, a casual stack of books lying around. The covers on these is where the cold working is. And I have to, to make the, the cover and then fit it perfectly so that it fits onto the pages before I glue it all together. So there's a lot of grinding and polishing of diamond tools to get the exact shape and to get the, the finish that I want. When you decided to make these books, have you done a lot of research? So the idea of the books, uh, it evolved. I, I had to make quite a few pieces before I could actually get it to what I wanted it to look like. And uh, the main thing I wanted was to have the light to transmit through the, the glass and show lovely translucency. I ran into a lot of technical problems. First of all, to fire that thick layer of glass together to get the pages, have it bubble free and then polish it and everything, that, that was a lot of work. And one of the, the big challenges was to stop the color of the pages from bleeding through the, the color of the cover. And if you look, there's a very fine uh, layer of white on the inside of the cover. And as you would find in a real book, but that's there to reflect the realism of the book, but it's also there to prevent that color of the pages from bleeding up into the overlying uh, cover and distorting that color. So, uh, and you, when you look at this, you can see I've done a lot of polishing. It's an optically polished, really smooth surface. And the edges are all nice and crisp and clean. And the pages of the cover and the spine all fit together really, really well. But when I assemble them, I like to get that casual look where they're, they're stacked. It's not an orderly bookshelf look. It's that end table or night table with just a, a couple of books that 
you happen to be reading at the time. You have a series of uh, sculptures based on books, 12 books, 15 books, Buddha books. <clears throat> How many do you have? Um, I've been making these books for quite a while and they actually have sold quite well for me. Uh, what I do is I make up a lot of books at a time and before I assemble them into individual stacks to go off to galleries, I try to uh, do a, a, a compilation piece and I always think of what it looks like in a library at the at closing time with stacks of books all over the place. So, so I, I do this first and, and they're just randomly positioned. And, um, uh, and I take that as a sort of a, a casual look and then the pieces are all um, grouped into three or four books at a time and shipped off to the galleries. Then you have Yamnuska. I've made a series of sculptures that are, are based on my geological background. And one of them is a series of, of mountains. And the real challenge is to take a massive feature like a mountain and reduce it down to a few simple lines and planes and intersecting elements. And Yamnuska and uh, uh, Mount Harris are, are a couple of examples of this. And what I've done is I've, I've taken um, the glass and generally I start off with building the model in, in um, paper first and just to, to get the proportions right. And then I'll cut the, the glass, assemble it, fire it together, and then do extensive shaping with, with uh, cold working tools with diamond wheels and things to, to get a, a texture that reflects the, the rocks um, and the stratigraphy. But the idea there is to try to capture all the essence of, of a mountain in very few simple lines. Uh, and again, it reflects back to my geological background. It keeps on a lot of my work. So Mount Harris uh, is another stylized mountain. It came from a uh, residency that I did at Pilchuck with uh, Bullseye Glass Company. I wanted to, again, marry my geological career with my artistic career. And <clears throat> over the course of five days, uh, I was trying to play with how I could do this. And when I left Pilchuck, I had two pieces of folded paper. And uh, those two pieces of folded paper became Mount Harris. And uh, that was the evolution, the beginning of my whole mountain series, and I've done quite a few of them. Uh, Mount Harris is, is named after Lauren Harris, the famous Canadian painter from the Group of Seven. And I loved how he uh, had all of his mountains that were extended up towards the sky um, in long angular shapes and, and colors. So uh, I really want to do that piece to honor Lauren Harris. So as I mentioned, geology really plays a, has a big influence on my work. And um, I, I've talked about the textures, I've talked about mountain sculptures. I also do things like stylized clams and uh, try to imagine uh, what their feeding mechanisms were. Some of these are kind of whimsical, but um, I, I, I just, again, it reflects uh, my geological background. Other pieces are sometimes built like rock walls and, and they represent the cliff faces that we see and the different uh, erosional patterns that you see in them because of uh, chemical or physical erosion. So a lot of my geological background creeps into my art. And uh, I actually think that's a good thing. It's where all have a past history and we should be, uh, that influences us whether we like it or not. I, I make these small sculptures that um, are, I call my Flotsam and my Jetsam series. And they're things that are washed up on the, on the beach and you see these wave patterns. And with some of these wave patterns, I actually look at the geological setting and what kind of waves you would see. So people might look at this and think, oh, the, that's a, a nice design. But a geologist would look at that and say, oh, that's a tidal flat. And so I, I 
sneak all these geological contexts into it. And I think it's um, it's a, a good way to blend my my previous training and my artistic career. To be a good scientist, you have to be creative. And I, so I think there's been a spillage of that creativity that goes into my uh, exploratory work in geology. It, it uh, translates into my, my art as well. The Mandelas, uh, Mandela clams are another version of clams. And what I did there was uh, they act, that was the beginning of the clam series, and I, I do like to uh, use happy accidents. And that started off as a bowl that broke. And when I looked at it, I, I thought for a long time, what can I do with this? And literally, it took me three or four months, and I have a table in the studio that I, I leave work on. And if I'm not how, sure how to resolve it, I will look at it, leave it there, and every time... I come into the studio, I have to address it. I have to acknowledge that it's there. And so eventually that mandala broken bowl or the broken bowl became the mandala clams. And I realized that I could take the two pieces and with a bit of work, marry them together and, and uh, join them in a hinge area and then put a, a, those long whip-like things in for feeding mechanisms. And that was the beginning of the whole clam series. And I started making more and more of them. Again, as I said, whimsical to see what sort of environment they would have lived in geologically and how they would have uh, fed and survived. So it's again a, a combination of my geological background and my uh, interest in glass. We moved to Salt Spring Island in 2008 and uh, Salt Spring is a lovely creative community on the west coast of Canada and it had a profound influence on me in many ways. First of all, I, I uh, got immersed in a community of painters and sculptors and, and musicians and writers, and, and it was uh, just this tremendous energy. And number two was it, it forced me into something that uh, I call now call my self-imposed residency, where I, I take three months or two months of the year and I work on something new, something outside my comfort zone. And when I started uh, associating with painters, we'd be looking at their artwork and they were always talking about the quality of the line and how the line is important in a painting or a drawing and how it uh, separates color fields, how it guides the eye, how, it, how important it is. And I looked at uh, kiln form glass as a whole and lines aren't that common in it. And it, the, there's a technical reason the, the glass has a, uh, it's easy to draw a line with a pencil at room temperature, but to draw a straight line on glass at 1500 degrees Fahrenheit is a real challenge because of things like surface tension and viscosity. So I started into this, this uh, self-imposed residency trying to figure out how to get lines into work. And the initial attempts were um, project here that's called the, the charcoal tan bowl, fine line bowl. And so I was able to figure out how to get lines in there in sort of conventional kiln form glass. And I really like to continue uh, playing the what if game, like what if I do this, how can I change it? And so that led me to try to just work with lines on, on their own. And this piece that's called four by 12, it's, the, each piece here starts off as a 12 inch diameter blank and I've um, slumped them into four different shapes. But what the uh, real intent was here was to try to look at how uh, I can get straight lines into uh, projects and have very graphic designs. Um, and the neat thing is these lines all start out straight, but when you slump them, they start to distort and bend and you get these lovely sweeping shapes. And so the first thing I did was, oh, let's, let's play with straight lines and you can buy something called stringers in glass. And it's stringer is essentially uncooked spaghetti. It, that's what it looks like. And you can place these on the glass and, and fire them in. And I figured out ways of getting them to have really clean intersections and really um, 
uh, sharp terminations and and no wobbles and everything. It really looked nice. But then I, as I continued to play the what if game, I thought, well, uh, how can I get different kinds of lines? And, you know, you hear the people talking about gesture lines where it's a spontaneous uh, pencil or, or brush stroke across the canvas. And so I wanted to, to get away from just straight lines and start playing with, with these more gesture lines. And what I did here was there's something called a vitrograph kiln where you essentially hang a small kiln on a wall, put a hole in the bottom of the kiln, a flower pot full of glass, you melt the, the glass in the flower pot, it dribbles out through the hole in the bottom of the kiln. And then as it comes out into a, this long st uh, stream of molten glass, you grab it with high temperature gloves and you shape it. So you can get these very spontaneous shapes by how you manipulate the glass. So that led to these gestural ones. And then I continue to think, well, what are other ways of doing it? And I wanted to get, instead of getting uh, gestural lines, I wanted to get a repeated uh, geometric shapes. And so this piece here, uh, when you look at it, they're all uh, lines from a, from a French curve and they're all intersecting all exactly the same shape. And you could never cut this out of a sheet of glass, but I figured out a way of doing it with a, a component called modeling glass, which turns the glass essentially into a polymer, turns powder into polymer clay, and you can you can shape and, and uh, design with it. So one of the things that I love to do is this, uh, the self-imposed residency where I take the influences I've heard from other artists and try to bring them into glass and then keep on modifying and then modifying them. So these are techniques that uh, I develop and I teach them through the glass community as well. And so again, uh, I, I make a lot of these bowls and I love to play with them. And this piece is called The World Set Turned Upside Down. And uh, I made this during the pandemic the beginning of the pandemic and uh, sort of reflects what was going on in society as a whole. But uh, I made these bowls and <laughs> and instead of presenting them as a regular bowl with opening towards the top, I turned them upside down. And I just love how the pattern reflects from one bowl to the other. And I didn't plan these to all uh, fit together like this, but they, they just do. And so there's, this picture of the five of them, and there's also a detailed picture that uh, I just uh, took, and it's almost like uh, looking down a canyon. And I, I just love, again, if you get up close, you see one thing. If you're from a distance, looking at it from a distance, you see something different. Then you have a series of pan pals. So, so I did a sculptural series uh, called the Pan Pals. And again, these were then at the uh, sort of the height of the pandemic. And this is one of my little Pan Pals here. And, uh, you know, we are all socially isolated. And I kept on, uh, it, you know, it was bothersome. I couldn't see my friends and, and family. And, and uh, I kept on thinking back to my mother would say, well, why don't you go out and make friends when I was a little boy? Go out and make friends. So I decided to make friends. And I thought back to, you know, my mother's time when you would connect with people that you couldn't uh, be close to by being pen pals. And so these became my pen pals, my pals through the pandemic. And they started off as a, a series of um, on different themes, some are on protection, some are on uh, community. And I started making ones that would address specific um, aspects. And so this one here was my concern for the coastal environment. And um, we have a lot of starfish that live on the Southern Gulf Islands. And with the heating of the oceans over the last decade, uh, it's killed off a lot of the starfish. So uh, I was combining uh, aspects of things I, I do in glass with the, these themes. Some of them were around the artisan, like the glass artist or the artisan that makes wares to sell. 
some uh, reflected back on our heritage. There's the, the cave, caveman pan pal that uh, looks at, you know, way, way, way back what society would have looked like. And uh, they were just uh, fun. And I have to be enjoying myself in the studio. And so these are whimsical pieces. Uh, they really uh, get me through a lot of that, that restrictions that came along with the, the uh, pandemic. They were fun to do. You are teaching worldwide. Would you like to talk about your uh, kiln formed glass education? I'm a glass artist, but I'm also a glass educator. And uh, I really enjoy being around creative people. And, and I think it's really important to be uh, in an artistic community to, to be able to pass on knowledge. Because I have a background in science, I can understand, develop an understanding of what's happening to glass from its physical properties, things like uh, coefficient of expansion, heat conductivity, uh, surface tension, uh, viscosity, uh, time and temperature, and all these things that, that um, you need to understand when you're working with glass. Also, uh, so much of what is involved with glass is based on visual observations. And my training as a geologist really made me look at uh, very subtle details and how would those subtle details reflect uh, in the quality or the outcome of the, of the glass project. So I got quite involved with education and it started off with teaching locally, but then uh, as it evolved, I started teaching um, throughout North America and then and that expanded over to Europe and Australia. And it was initially with my crackle texture and all those textures that were derived from it. But uh, it's also evolved into uh, other techniques as well. And so I used to spend one week a month teaching somewhere in the world uh, with the pandemic and me getting on in years. I've cut back on that. Now I'm doing a lot of uh, online tutorials that I do through a, a studio in the, in the United Kingdom. And I just really enjoy being in classrooms with people. It's, it's fun. It's, you can feel an energy. And on top of that, I do, uh, between my wife Lisbeth and I, we've published four ebooks. Three of them are on uh, the textured techniques I've discussed here, the pebble textures, the crackle texture, all those neat things you do with glass powders. But one of them is also involved with uh, looking at uh, the properties of glass and developing firing schedules. And the firing schedules in, in glass are, uh, you really have to understand how to program the kiln, what's going to happen to it uh, as it heats and cools. And I have a graph here that shows uh, two zones uh, during the firing process. One is called the brittle zone. That's essentially what we see at room temperature. And it's from room temperature up to about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the glass behaves brittly. If you drop a glass in your kitchen, it breaks. But above that temperature, it starts to behave in a ductile or plastic manner. And so what I've done is I've, I've looked at all the different processes and I have some images here of pieces like if you don't do it properly, there's a piece here that shows how the glass is just shattered and that's thermal shock. The glass hasn't heated evenly and it just blew apart during the initial heating up. So things like viscosity, I do all sorts of experiments because of my scientific background. I understand how to design experiments that test various properties of glass and, and I use that to explain things to people. So there's this series of colored glass rods here, and they're all slumped at the same time, but you can see they've all bent different amounts, and that different amount in the bending reflects the uh, viscosity of the glass, how easy it is to flow at a given temperature. So by looking at that, you can see that white glasses will, will slump or melt at higher temperatures than dark colored glasses like black. And that's really important when you're doing things like, like slumping glass. The other thing is I, I look at um, 
observations. And again, as I said, this refers back to my geological background, but I have an image here of a piece that was, uh, before it was fired and then when it was uh, fused to tack fuse, it's just a diagram, but there's different things that you see and it's subtle things like how rough is the edge, how sharp is the corner on the, the piece and how well bonded it is to the underlying glass. And so I, I make all these critical observations and I use that to decide how to fire the glass to get it to do what I want. And now I pass that information on in, uh, in these eBooks and also through, through videos, online teaching. And I publish articles through Glass Art Magazine. Um, so it's, it's become a, a big part of my glass profession and I really enjoy doing it. It's, it's uh, I consider an important thing to be doing. A lot of the things I do relate to problem solving too. And this little diagram here shows one of the common problems that people have when they're slumping glass is that the glass will start to uh, slide sideways at the onset of slumping. And so you can go in and with high temperature gloves and you can actually move things around on the mold while it's, as it begins to slump. So uh, a lot of people have trouble getting their pieces to slump property. And I share this information on social media through Facebook and groups like that, where there's, we have discussion groups that talk about problems. I really enjoy getting in there and helping with, with problem solving. A lot of the other things that people do are things like dropout molds and the goblets that you saw earlier, the usual suspects, this was how they were made. And you can see that if uh, in some situations, the glass will actually fall off the mold and it just ends up ruining the piece. But if you build your mold a certain way with bevels in it, then, then uh, you don't have that problem. So I share all this information through, through the glass community and through teaching. And some very, like the deep vessels that I've shown you, they're very challenging to slump. And um, it's hard to get them to slump evenly. And so you have to think about where the heat is in the kiln, um, how the glass is moving on the mold. And, and when you put it all together, there are solutions. And I just have, through experimentation, have ways that, that get it to, to work. The other thing is uh, through my self-imposed residencies, I learn new techniques and so develop new techniques and I talked earlier about the development of lines. Well, one of the other things I did was I wanted to learn how to do printmaking with glass. And that's become a popular uh, topic and to explore it a little bit differently. And so I got a book out on printmaking and I kept on thinking, how can I apply this to, to glass as opposed to paper? And uh, I started doing experiments with lino cut blocks and essentially doing a lino cut block impression of a carved fish. And once I fired that, uh, then I could, uh, and it was just white, I would carve the outline of the fish so it's just the fish and no, no powder around it. And then I could go in and hand color it with, um, in a monoprint style with just using uh, colored powders and uh, dabbing them on and washing them in. And, when I started doing this, I started saying, well, all, how can I color them in? And I've shown you one example here with bullseye transparent powders, but you could use enamels, you could use scraffito, you could use opaque powder, powders, you could use micas, all sorts of things to get different effects. And so uh, I've shared this again with the community. I think it's really important to, to do this. And I, it's something I really enjoy doing. It's not a, it's not a task at all. And your manuals, your textbooks, are often accompanied by workbooks. So the ebooks that we did on textured glass powders started off with doing one on basic crackle. When I did that, when it was it was the introduction, it was the groundwork. And when I got really involved with it, I realized there's other things that I could do. So the first book was just how you do the basic crackle. And then the second book, which was the intermediate kiln form glass powders, uh, took that basic crackle and started modifying it to get pebbles 
controlled orientation, color filled veins, all sorts of really neat different textures by using the scientific method to vary things like the water to powder ratio or when you built it, the sequence of building, uh, how hot you fired it, all sorts of things. And uh, so the first two books were just technique. And then the third book, which was a workbook, was really looking at um, more from a design viewpoint. And so instead of doing uh, the basic crackle, how can you modify it to, to be on certain parts of the bowl or to be uh, to work with chemical reactions or to vary the size of the, of the texture and to think more about design. So I really, uh, the workbook was a series of exercises that took the technical aspects and put them more into a, a design context, which I think is really, that's where we want to be is designing good glass. So one of the aspects of our eBooks that I'm really proud of is the quality of the eBooks. And uh, that's due in large part to uh, my wife, Lisbeth, who has 25 years of experience, both in writing books, editing books. She was managing editor. She's done scientific journals. She's really good with the written word. And so all the, the design work and the, the layout and uh, the quality of the editing is all her work. And uh, during the process of writing the books, we would get together every day and ask me for clarification on things. And she'd say, uh, explain this to me a different way because I don't understand. And she would be in the audience's viewpoint. She's a scientist herself, but she'd say, find a, another way of saying this. And so I'd do that. And we'd keep on working back and forth until uh, she found that, yes, this is accessible information. And quite often she would actually come into the studio, watch me do something, and then write up, here's the steps that he's doing. And so the clarity and the uh, quality of the books is really a, a great uh, contribution from these. But in our firing schedule book is very popular. It's been a lot of people refer to it as one of the standards for kiln-form glass. So um, uh, when I refer to the books, I always say our books. And it's not because I'm thinking in the royal we. I'm thinking that it's our, these bets and my contribution together. So uh, I'm really proud of them. I would like to talk a little bit about the hazards. Kiliform glass, if it's done properly, is reasonably safe. And uh, the kilns themselves heat up to uh, 1500 degrees Fahrenheit or about 820 degrees Celsius. And uh, that sounds pretty, pretty drastic, but it's really, it's not much different than opening the, your, the door on your oven. And so when I do this, I, I'm wearing um, high temperature gloves if I'm manipulating the glass in the kiln. Uh, if it's really hot, I have a, a heat resistant face shield um, when I'm, the, the main safety hazard is working with the powders themselves in the, in their dry form. And when I do that, I wear a, a asbestos grade respirator all the time when I work in the studio and I'm very careful with my shop practices. Uh, when you're doing cold working or you're grinding the glass, you have to have water feeding onto it during the grinding process to not only last cool and stop it from breaking because of the heat, but also to uh, capture any uh, dust so that you don't get uh, airborne dust, which you can in inhale. So if you have good shop practices, this is uh, less dangerous than most hobbies. Uh, just, you know, you just have to have common sense and good shop practices. Looks like more and more women are um, uh, embracing this type of art. I call it kiln form glass underground movement because most people have their studios set up in their basement. And it's a very, uh, very accessible hobby and, and the pastime. If you have a kiln, uh, once you buy the kiln, um, it costs about $5 a firing. And when you're not firing the kiln, all it is is 
an expensive thermometer in your basement. So it's, it's actually fairly easy to get into. And a lot of people are embracing kiln-formed glass because you can work on it in a casual basis, uh, again, with uh, easy access to the tools and equipment and supplies. And uh, it's become quite a, a very popular hobby. And it's getting more and more sophisticated if you go online and look at some of the work that's being done. It's, it's rapidly moving into fine art with a lot of wall work and, and uh, large sculptures and really complex work. So it has a, an entire breadth of possibilities from making uh, very simple uh, and fun uh, small projects like coasters or votive candles or, or small uh, plates and bowls right up to pieces that are worth uh, $50,000. So it's the whole gamut and, and it's become very popular for people to do this. It's, um, uh, but most people that are embracing this are, don't come from a scientific background. And so this is where my strength is, is that I understand the process and what's going on in the kiln. And by uh, thinking and helping people th through that process and putting it in language that they understand, uh, it makes it much easier for, for people that don't have a scientific background to actually have success in, in working in kiln form glass. And that's what my real objective is. Since the pandemic, I haven't been able to travel for teaching, but I have been doing online classes and I do them through um, a studio in the United Kingdom, Warren Glass UK. And uh, there, I do them one class a month and they range on topics from the kiln form powders that you've seen here to the quality of line workshop. I do joint workshops with other artists where we look at uh, master classes and, and very difficult techniques like doing those deep slumping pieces. And uh, I also am, am doing a, or was doing a series on concept to creation, how to, to go from you, an idea and actually the steps and the logic of going and, and getting a complete piece that matches what your vision was, initial vision. And um, I, I really enjoy it. Their classes are small with uh, only 20 people in them. So we have lots of interaction, lots of feedback. They have a Facebook group that each uh, class can post images and we can discuss the technical problems and, and lots of other things. So it's, uh, it's a good way to learn. And um, I'm getting to meet people from all over the world doing it. So it's, it's again, fun. Let's talk about the resources available, the videos on techniques through AAE Glass. I have a series of videos that I've done through AAE Glass in uh, Florida, and they're, uh, they're getting into very specialized topics. One of them is uh, working with textured powders, like uh, in the eBooks, but I've taken it one step further and I go into, in that video, how to blend powders, how to, build veins and, and various textures into the powders and all the, uh, the practical things about the most sophisticated way I can, I can do in, in blending powders and how to get that really unique palette. And then one of the other challenges uh, that artists have is making stands. And, uh, you know, you make a, quite often if you go to a, a a fabricator, it'll cost as much for the stand as it will for the, for the glass piece. So I've, through my own uh, problem solving, I have ways of making my own stands and you can see them in things like the pan pals. Uh, those stands I, I make from slate tile and uh, uh, stainless steel TIG welding rod and it costs pennies. Like maybe the, one of those pan pal stands is $5. The, the bouquet piece that you saw, that hangs on the, on the outside wall of our house. I think the hanger for all the pieces in there would, would probably amount to about $2 worth of materials. So uh, these are the challenges to get a, a hanger or a stand system that 
shows off the glass but doesn't de detract from the glass. And, and I, I think I've got some good ideas on how to do that. So I share a lot of ideas with uh, uh, the glass community through those videos. You also publish articles in Glass Art Magazine. So Glass Art Magazine is, a, is probably the preeminent uh, glass magazine in the market. And uh, I've been doing a series of articles in their section called Tips and Techniques for the last five years. And each article covers some aspect, uh, some challenge uh, that I've worked with over the years and my solutions to them. And so it ranges from techniques such as making powder wafers or how to test and blend powders, how to test for chemical reactions. Uh, some of them are, are philosophical, like my self-imposed residency. I, I talk about how I use that to stimulate my, my creative uh, interests. Um, and how to make those books. I, I went into the details of how to make them. So it's a, it's a, how to use your kiln properly and most efficiently how to program the kiln. So there's a whole range of topics on uh, things that I think have good practical application in the kiln form glass um, art field. What and, are your plans for um, this year? I have two plans. We're, we're still continuing with the education, so I'm in the process of writing another ebook on um, on this quality of line series, and uh, I've gone completely off in a different direction. And I'm doing lamp working, which is not kiln form glass; it's it's Venetian style glass with a propane torch, propane oxygen torch, and using glass rods to make. Um, various things. I just, I love the immediacy of it. I'm doing a lot of marbles right now. And it's, it's a nice diversion from doing kiln form glass, which might take five days to make a project to working on a marble, which might take three hours. And uh, I work every day in the studio. Uh, I enjoy doing it. It's a, a passion and I'm always learning. Um, I support galleries and it's just um, totally obsessed by it. So it's a great, a great way to work. You also sent me photos of Enlightenment. It's an urban. There's a on Salt Spring. There's a there's a Salt Spring National Art Prize, and I'm involved with that in an organizational viewpoint. But it's a national prize. I really like it because it forces me to push my work to the very best I can do. And so one of the years that I, I was in that, uh, I entered a piece called City of Enlightenment. And it's, it's a sculptural piece. It's almost a meter by a meter square. And uh, it's made up of glass blocks that, that are uh, oh, two and a half to, to four centimeters thick. And they stand up on, on a base. And it looks kind of like an urban environment, a cityscape. And um, I just, it was just a lot of fun to make. Uh, it took me probably two months to make that project, but there's a lot of coal working and, and I made all these blocks and I had to assemble them in a way that I thought was uh, reflected a cityscape. And uh, I was really pleased with the outcome.